Hello, and welcome to the C-Drill third quarter 2024 earnings call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question at that time, please press star one on your telephone keypad. I would now like to turn the conference over to Lydia Mabry, Director of Investor Relations. You may begin. Welcome to C-Drill's third quarter 2024 earnings call. Today's call will feature prepared remarks from Simon Johnson, our President and Chief Executive Officer, Samir Ali, Executive Vice President and Chief Commercial Officer, and Grant Creed, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Our comments include forward-looking statements that involve risks and uncertainty. Actual results may differ materially. No one should assume these forward-looking statements remain valid later in the quarter or year, and we assume no obligation to update. Our latest Forms 20S and 6K, filed with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, provide a more detailed discussion of our forward-looking statements and the risk factors that affect our business. During the call, we will also reference non-GAAP measures. Our earnings release, filed with the SEC and available on our website, includes reconciliations with the nearest corresponding GAAP measures. Our use of the term EBITDA on today's call corresponds with the term adjusted EBITDA, as defined in our earnings release. I'll now turn the call to Simon. Thank you for joining us on our quarterly conference call. I will begin with a few comments on our quarterly performance before discussing our market outlook and strategy. Samir will then talk about tactics and contracting before Grant reviews our quarterly financial and operational performance and full year outlook. Our third quarter results exceeded expectations. We delivered $93 million in adjusted EBITDA, securing additional work and uncommitted capacity propels us above our previous full year guidance. Most notably, the Savannah, Louisiana continued its existing contract with an independent operator in the US Gulf of Mexico. We're now increasing our EBITDA guidance midpoint by 13% to $385 million. Our continued progress on Brazil projects minimizes the downside risk to guidance. Both the West Auriga and West Polaris are in country and going through the customer and regulatory acceptance process after clearing customs in record time. Our operations teams focused attention on these critical projects, meaning these rigs are on track to begin their new contracts in December and will then start generating meaningful EBITDA and cash flow. During the quarter, we stacked the West Phoenix to reduce operating and capital expense in the absence of an immediate market opportunity. We are unwilling to spend valuable shareholder capital investing in a rig without a bedrock of continuous visible demand. We've released the crews and are actively reducing direct rig OPEX. Following the completion of the West Capella and West Valor's recent contracts, we've now also reintegrated the four Aquadrill drill ships back into the Cedral fleet. In the 18 months since closing the transaction, we have successfully navigated complex costly rig management agreements and exceeded all cost synergy targets. The Vela and Capella, along with the Auriga and the Polaris, are now managed and crewed to Cedral standards and can reliably provide the safe, efficient, responsible operations customers expect from our organisation. Now on to market outlook and strategy. We firmly believe underlying industry fundamentals remain intact, characterised by the interaction between increasingly inelastic supply and inherently variable demand. The prevailing market question is when and where those lines intersect. In our view, the temporary imbalance between drill ship supply and demand is not a true reflection of the fundamentals that support a sustained strong industry up cycle, but rather a reminder of the market's volatility. This volatility only deepens my conviction in our strategy, operating a floater focused fleet that benefits from strong contract coverage, preserving a good balance sheet and maintaining a relentless and virtuous focus on continued efforts to strengthen and simplify our business. At the heart of our plan to win is operating the right rigs in the right regions. In our experience, most deepwater opportunities require dual activity drill ships with 15k BOPs and MPD capabilities. Rigs focused on achieving operational efficiency and endurance rather than exploring technical frontiers. Our fleet meets those requirements. All our drill ships are dual activity and dual BOP capable or equipped. 75% of the drill ships we operate are 7th gen, and in 2025 we expect 80% of our own drill ships will have MPD, 
as we focus on leading the industry in thought and practice in this important operational activity. We operate premium quality assets in the heart of the market. We cluster almost all our rigs in the Golden Triangle, spanning the Gulf of Mexico, South America and West Africa, which represents the greatest concentration of deep water drilling activity now and into the foreseeable future. We've secured 70% contract utilisation for our marketed and managed fleet in calendar year 2025, a figure that is expected to improve with time as customer conversations convert to contracts. In addition to our contract coverage, we benefit from a strong balance sheet and our current cash position feels prescient in today's market. However, we recognise this does not completely insulate us from competitive market realities. We will not rest on our laurels. We will continue to evaluate better, smarter ways of running our business. 2025 will be a year in which we focus increasingly on optimising our operations. We want to be a lean, efficient, right-sized drilling contractor. We plan to reduce bureaucracy across the organisation, empowering our senior leaders offshore to do what they do best leading, supervising and mentoring their teams to the benefit of our customers who can on us every day to deliver safe, efficient, responsible operations. By doing right for our employees and our customers, we'll do right for our shareholders. We must remain agile. We will continue to evaluate opportunities to refine and grow our fleet, dynamically adjust our costs as our active rig count fluctuates and further solidify our formidable financial position. Now, as ever, we're focused on what we can control, how we sign our contracts, how we run our rigs, and how we allocate our capital. Our commercial team continues working to secure contracts with terms that maximise each rig's earnings and cash flow. Our operations teams continue to keep drill bits turning to the right, operating costs low, crews safe, and customers happy. And our leadership team endeavours to remain disciplined stewards of shareholder capital. We constantly evaluate our approach to capital allocation based on market conditions, outlook and competitive positioning, and the relative impact these decisions have on strengthening the procedural story. Clear examples of that capital stewardship have been our continued fleet refinement and in industry leading share of purchases. We were the first of our peers to pursue a meaningful buyback program and have reduced our issued share count by 19% since September 23 improving our per share performance across key metrics. At Cedrill, we've continuously made decisions to simplify and strengthen our business for the benefit of our shareholders. And as we make our way through 2025, it should become increasingly clear that we build a resilient business that can deliver real returns to shareholders through the cycle, especially once 2026 contract repricing comes more clearly into focus. With that, I'll pass the line to Samir. Thanks, Simon. By our estimation, there are about 95 competitive drill ships in the global marketplace. Approximately 20 of these are inactive and require extensive investment to be put to work, as they are either cold stacked or not so new builds, with limited to no operating history. But slow contracting activity can make even a thin market seem temporarily oversupplied. Between now and the end of next year, around 30 competitive drill ships will become available after completing their current contracts. Many of these rigs will find follow-on opportunities, but not all of them. The absence of visible demand to consume available capacity will soften the market. Drill ship marketed utilization, a measure of market tightness, slipped below 90% in April, after rising for over a year. It now hovers in the high 80s and will likely continue to trend lower. As more assets become available, it will put downward pressure on rates, leading us to believe 2025 will be increasingly competitive. Fortunately, we are relatively insulated. In 2025, we benefit from 70% market utilization across our fleet. Recent updates to existing drilling programs filled some of the white space. For example, the Vela is not working through the third quarter of 2025, and the West Carina and the West Tellus are now committed fully through year end and into early next year. We have the most market exposure next year in the, the Savannah, Louisiana, the West Capella, and the Sauna Drill drill ships. As we've said before, the Louisiana has a broad range of potential outcomes. Opportunities can appear and disappear quickly. Recent contracts suitable for the rig specifications have been shortened both their lead times and their duration, which limits our ability to plan with an acceptable level of certainty. 
As time progresses, we may show less willingness to play the spot market and will stack the rig. For the Capella, the Gemini, the Kingella, and the Labongos, our focus remains on securing contracts for the second half of the year. We believe all these rigs are competitively advantaged. They benefit from premium specification, proven work history, and deep customer relationships, making us a preferred provider for customers who have chosen Cedral time and time again. However, there is a scarcity of immediately available, visible opportunities. We continue to see a slow pace of contracting tied to the market, uncertainties, and capital restraint. In Angola, for example, we're seeing indications of softening rig demand as the basin competes for capital across customers' global portfolios. We continue to make positive progress on recontracting and repricing the Jupiter, Carina, and the TELUS, seeing term contracts that provide visibility of earnings and cash flow. As we consider the market, we don't believe drilling contractors can create demand, and we are not willing to contribute to our own white space, idly burning OPEX waiting for the desired opportunities to emerge. With every decision we make, we consider cash flow per rig. We strive to achieve favorable economics across our individual units and our full fleet. When those economics are challenged, we will act decisively. We are dispassionate managers of valuable shareholder capital. As we navigate through near-term air pockets, we intend to remain disciplined with the way we manage our fleet. Across the market, competitive choices will dictate financial outcomes. And with that, I'll turn it to Grant. Thanks, Svea. I'll review our third quarter performance before providing an updated outlook for the full year. In the third quarter, Cedral earned $354 million in total operating revenues, down from $375 million the prior quarter. Contract drilling revenues were effectively flat quarter on quarter at $263 million. The benefit of the Louisiana contributing a full quarter of revenue at a higher average rate, complemented by higher economic utilization across the fleet, was offset by the Phoenix and Capella contract completions. Management contract and leasing revenues declined sequentially. Our second quarter results included income related to retroactive adjustments to the management fees and Bevo charter income earned from our Sonna Drill JV, and BBC income from the Gulf Drill Jackup rigs we sold in June. Third quarter management contract revenues were $62 million, and leasing revenues were $9 million. Third quarter results provide a good indication of expected run rates for both these line items through the end of the solid drill rigs current contracts. Additionally, we earned $20 million in reimbursable revenues. The $5 million sequential increase was accompanied by an equivalent increase in reimbursable expenses. In the third quarter, we incurred total operating expenses of $307 million, up from $290 million in the prior quarter. Vessel and rig OPEX increased by $7 million to $172 million, and management contract expense increased by $4 million to $45 million. The timing of repair and maintenance expenses drove the increase. RM is the second largest cost component on rig PLs, so variances can have a meaningful OPEX impact. SGNA was $27 million and included $2 million of costs related to the consolidation of our corporate office in Houston which we consider a non-recurring adjusting item from EBITDA. Third quarter adjusted EBITDA was $93 million. Adjusted EBITDA margin, excluding reimbursables, was 27.5%. In the third quarter, we spent $131 million in CapEx, including $78 million of long-term maintenance captured within operating activities in the cash flow statement and $53 million of capital upgrades captured in investing cash flows. In the third quarter, we continued our share of purchase program, completing $183 million of share of purchases under our current $500 million authorization. Now that we're no longer listed in our low, we intend to report repurchases on a quarterly basis in arrears. Since initiating our repurchase programs in September 2023, we have returned a total of $692 million to shareholders through the end of the third quarter and reduced our issued share count by 19%. Now, on to our outlook for the rest of the year. As Simon mentioned earlier, we're increasing our full year guidance. For 2024, we now expect adjusted EBITDA of $375 to $395 million on revenues of roughly $1.4 billion 
and we're narrowing our full year guidance for CapEx to $420 to $440 million. Our ability to secure additional work on the Louisiana is the primary driver behind the guidance range. The rig continued working from August into November and potentially through December, effectively lifting our full year EBITDA midpoint to $385 million. Our full year outlook implies lower run rate EBITDA for the fourth quarter, primarily attributable to lower operating activity. Specifically, the Phoenix being stacked following its most recent contract completion, the Capella finishing its latest job in September before starting new work in mid-December, the Neptune spending approximately 50 days out of service while it undergoes its SPS and other upgrades, and lastly, the Vela incurring out of service time in October when it was reintegrated into the Cedral fleet. In addition to this, on the cost side, we have expectations for increased OPEX based on the timing of repairs and maintenance activity planned to take place in the fourth quarter. The Auriga and Polaris are on track to commence contracts in the fourth quarter. Precise timing of these start dates will impact Q4 results and having these rigs working again will help drive run rate EBITDA higher in the new year. Year to date, we've spent a total of $286 million on CapEx and we anticipate a meaningful increase in Q4 as we complete Brazil contract preparation for the Auriga and Polaris. Looking into 2025, we believe it's too early to provide guidance as contract discussions and negotiations for uncommitted capacity are ongoing and the outcome of which will materially affect our financial outcome. Back to you, Simon. Thanks, Grant. 2024 has been a significant year of transition for Cedral. Amidst headwinds like idle time, inflation and required fleet investment that we identified and communicated early, we continue to progress our efforts to simplify and strengthen our business. We sold the Gulf drill jackups and we integrated the aqua drill drill ships. We delisted from the OSE. We maintained a healthy balance sheet and we continued our industry leading repurchase program. Throughout the year, we've consistently beat our peers in total shareholder return. We're recognized as a universal buy across the sell side from Norwegian and US analysts alike who recognize the continued value we're positioned to deliver as 2026 contract repricing comes into focus. We intend to run our business relative to the opportunities available in the marketplace, not the ones that we hope may materialize. We will not burn valuable shareholder capital praying for better weather. It's clear to us that in the past 18 months, too many rigs have been reactivated by our trade rivals without sustainable matching demand beyond initial contracts. I'm proud of what we've accomplished as an organization thus far and recognize there's more work to do as we continue to strengthen Cedril to the benefit of our employees, our customers, and our shareholders. Expect us to be disciplined as we seek to create meaningful value now and into the future. With that, we'll open the line for questions. Operator? Thank you. As a reminder, if you have a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, simply press star one again. Your first question comes from the line of David Smith with Pickering Energy Partners. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. Uh, congratulations on the quarter and the the increased guidance. Thanks, David. I, I know it's a little farther out, but you know, given the, the tenders out there and, and including one recently opened, I, I wanted to ask about your outlook for your fuel ships in Brazil, um, specifically the, the Jupiter, Carina, and Telus. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, let me kick off and then maybe Samir can add some embroidery at the end. Um, I mean, Brazil is the most important and the most resilient deep water market on the planet. Um, and as we said before, recontracting our rigs in Brazil is a primary focus for the organisation. As you know, we don't announce contracts until they're formally signed, so we have no specific news uh, to share with you today on the status of those rigs. But as Samir pointed out in his prepared remarks, we continue to make meaningful, positive progress with our customer on recontracting um, our rigs in Brazil, and we're pretty optimistic about the future of those rigs. Petrobras has rec recently recognised our performance by awarding us a drilling contractor of the year, which was uh, a nice uh, bouquet to receive. And whereas some deep water regions face near-term headwinds, Brazil's remained stable in terms of demand outlook, which we really like. Um, we believe that yet again we've made a prescient decision and bet on Brazil at the right time. So as an incumbent in Brazil, we'll soon have five rigs working for Petrobras. 
um, that we've deployed over the last two years. We're keenly aware of the advantage that confers when recontracting in country, not just money and cost of entry. It's obviously also about you know schedule and regulatory risk. So there's a lot of talk about near-term turbulence in 2025. We're largely contracted in terms of rig days for 25. For us, Brazil is a key part of our story. Um, unlike our rivals, we're not recontracting rigs, we're not hot stacking rigs. Our story is very, very simple. It's all about recontracting in Brazil. Anything to add, Samir? No, I would just say, you know, we, we remain confident in our abilities to recontract those rigs and are making meaningful progress, but don't have ink on a page, so there's nothing to announce at this point. I appreciate all the color. If I could uh, ask a, a follow-up, um, I, I noticed any of these orders this quarter included uh, hook load upgrades to convert two sixth-gen drill ships for seventh-gen capabilities. And I, I wanted to ask how you see the potential for additional you know, sixth to seventh-gen upgrades and, and whether this might reshape the seventh-gen supply demand balance going forward. Yeah, great question. Um, look, I, I think the distinction between 6 and 7 gen is somewhat arbitrary. I mean, generally speaking, it's as much about year of delivery as anything. Um, I think it's fair to say that there is a broad spectrum of technical capability across the 6 gen fleet. Most 6 gen units are midlife now, so there's a, you know, often a need to review obsolete systems and renew marine coatings, particularly after the reduced investment associated with a decade-long de depressed market. So I'm presuming it's about 2.5 million hook load upgrades. Um, Samir will have some comments on that, I'm sure. Sure. So, you know, I'd say uh, hook load's one factor between a 6 and a 7, but it's not the only one. You know, the rigs being upgraded are, are have their own technical challenges beyond just hook load. Um, and candidly, we're prudent uh, with our shareholder capital, and we're not going to invest in an upgrade unless we can see a return on it. We are looking at other upgrades on our six gen assets, but those are, you know, we can monetize and we can actually generate a return on capital on those investments. And for whatever it's worth, our six gens are located in markets that have a proven track record, and then you really don't need the extra hook load. And so for us, we feel very comfortable with where our six gens are upgraded, and we don't need to see the need to upgrade them at this point. Great call, I appreciate it. Thanks, David. Your next question comes from Kurt Hollied with Benchmark. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Kurt. Uh, always appreciate the uh, the color color commentary. So, um, I guess as as we uh, look out into into next year, a couple things caught my my attention uh, with respect to the be prepared commentary. Uh, so I was just looking for maybe a little bit more, maybe context or, around it. And the first was, uh, I think Samir, you referenced that uh, you know the market um, dynamics are such that in 2025, any contracts that that get booked will be um, price competitive. And at the same time, you know, you referenced that you are uh, looking to kind of maximize, you know, the uh, the cash the cash margin dynamics. So. Um, maybe give us some some context around that, and and maybe you know, are you seeing some opportunities to, um, you know, despite maybe some price competitiveness, to to maintain cash margins at about where they are uh, on existing contracts, and and is there some regional differences we need to consider? Yeah, absolutely, Kurt. Uh, so I'd say you know when we look at bidding work, we're very very focused on the cash generation. Um, you know, head, headline day rates nice, but at the end of the day, can we generate cash? Each market's individual. Your opex is going to be different. Your capex requirements to comply with the contract are going to be different. So for us, we look to maximize our cash flow wherever we, we when we bid work. You know, in terms of our fleet, we are 70% contracted into next year. Uh, we're, you know, most of our opportunities are for the second half of next year. We're in active dialogue on most of those assets, if actually all of those assets that are rolling off in the second half of next year. So for us, we feel pretty good in our ability to recontract them, again, at, at good rates for where they're at. Um, but at the end of the day, for us, we, it's less about headline day rate. It's much more about cash flow generation. Just to um, add, add there, Kurt, to a couple of extra points. Um, I mean, as uh, you would know as an experienced commentator on, on the business, I mean, there's material economies of scale to be harvested by industry participants, and many of these are a function of how many rigs you have in discrete geography, choosing the right markets in the first place. There are material differences in cost across uh, different markets. Um, as a management team, we are really committed to dealing with market realities, and we're determined to operate a franchise that flexes overhead, OPEX and CAPEX dynamically to reflect the business environment. And we'll adjust these individual elements 
to continue to deliver superior margins to our shareholders. That's always been a feature of Cedral through time and as a core proposition to our investors. Gotcha. And, and maybe on the, on the follow-up, you guys have been, you know, um, very uh, capital return friendly and, and you're on pace probably to, you know, buy back at, I don't know, about $500 million uh, worth of, of stock this year. Uh, given the fact that you're, like, say, only 70% booked um, on your on your contracts and, and maybe some relatively soft dynamics um, in, in a pricing environment, you know, how do you see the opportunity to, or do you see an opportunity to potentially buy back as much stock in 2025 as you did in 2024? Hey, Kurt, it's Grant here. Look, I mean, of course, we can't comment specifically on how much we're going to buy back next year. All I'd say is, you know, consistent with prior calls, when we look at the buybacks, we're really going through our financial policy framework. And, you know, beginning with the outlook in, in future years, and, and of course, that goes hand in hand with the, the 2025 comments that Samir was talking about and the 70% contracting to the extent that firms up, then that gives us a lot more confidence to lean into capital returns and, and uses of capital. Um, just to reiterate the financial policy, you know, looking at one times net leverage, um, paying our maintenance capex, and then thereafter looking at accretive uses of capital. And that accretive uses of capital can be um, buying other assets and it could be returning uh, capital to shareholders and really just weighing up those two and, and at the end of the day what's going to be more accretive for our shareholders. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, I, I actually got one more if I may, you know, may maybe on Simon for this one. Um, you know, given the, again, a little bit of a lull that we have in, in uh, opportunities in the first part of, of 2025, you guys have always mentioned that, you know, you're agnostic as to whether or not you buy assets or, you know, wind up being, you know, on on the other end of that. Um, but in the context of potentially, you know, looking at some assets, has this this lull presented some opportunities that maybe didn't exist earlier in the year? Um, I think it's um, – it, I'm expecting that will become more of a feature if this um, ends up being a more protracted sort of turbulent period. Um I mean, obviously, we, you know, our balance sheet is poised to respond if it, the right opportunity presents itself. Um, you know, we've spoken before about the strict metrics that any uh, potential acquisition needs to um, needs to hit in terms of returns, accretion analysis, and so on. Um, and so, at the moment, I don't think there's there's anything, um, but you know, that, that's on the horizon right now. But there's certainly a number of players in the industry who will not be able to withstand an extended period of hardship. And um, we keep a watching brief, um, and uh, and uh, I think our board's you know very supportive about the opportunity for growth of that nature. Great, appreciate all that. Thanks. Cheers, Kurt. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Frederick Steen with Clarkson Securities. Your line is open. Hey, Simon and team. Hope you are uh, well, and thank you for for taking our question. So. I think that the first one that I'd like to ask is, is just on the you know, geographical uh, spread of your, your fleet uh, currently. You, you have you know, a meaningful number of, of rigs in, in Brazil, particularly with the Auriga and the Polaris uh, coming onto their contracts now uh, shortly, and, and you're otherwise well covered in the Gulf of Mexico and, and West Africa. But, but then you have the Capella, for example, in, in Southeast Asia. How do you, you know, feel about the placement of, of that uh, single rig? Uh, or are you confident that you can get opportunities uh, in in the region it's already in, or do you think, or, or to talk about potential relocation of, of any of your assets? Uh, well, um, as you know, Fred, we have a declared strategy of clustering rigs wherever possible. Um, we've only recently taken control of the Capella. And um, as the market has, you know, become a little bit challenging and more competitive in the near term, um, we've focused mainly on opportunities um, in the region where it's currently operating. Um, so I, I think, at, you know, at this point, um, we're, con you know, we're content to chase the work that we see in that area. But, um, you know, in the medium term, we would hope to secure a contract that will permit the relocation of that rig um, uh, into an area where we already have a, um, a pre-existing competitive position. 
Um, but Samir can probably give you a bit more color. Yeah, so, you know, to Simon's point, we are chasing opportunities both in that region and outside. But if we can uh, you know, secure work that generates meaningful cash flow in that region, we'll happily keep the rig out there. But the eventual plan would be to cluster it either into an existing region or develop Southeast Asia as a new region for ourselves as well. Okay, no, that, that, that's very helpful. Um, and then, I guess, briefly touching upon... You know, the, the high level uh, fleet uh, co composition and, and thinking about your assets, particularly now that you've uh, decided to, to stack um, the West Phoenix. How do you think about you know that move and, for example, the Aquarius uh, and the Eclipse in terms of potential pecking order if they were to, to be reactivated? Is there now a higher likelihood of, of you guys actually you know, scrapping uh, one of the one of the two? Is that well, we don't have any immediate plans in, um, in that regard. Um, what I'd say is that uh, the Phoenix and the Aquarius um, are both easier to reactivate than the Eclipse. The Eclipse definitely will have a larger capital ask um, and would require a larger uh, body of work to underwrite its reactivation. Um, so, I mean, the, the way we think about it is that, you know, we need the, you know, a material contribution to defray that capital reactivation cost. Uh, and we need to see a, um, you know, a sense of, of comfort that there'll be a sustaining market after that re initial reactivation contract to keep the rig busy. It, but we continue to market both the, the Phoenix and the Aquarius. Um, and if we find the right opportunity that justifies the investment, we'll do it. But it, it's, a, it's a tall order, right? For us, we need to find a job that justifies the investment in those rigs. But of the three, the Phoenix and the Aquarius are probably the more capable rigs, and we'd look at reactivating those first. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, just one quick one, and I think this goes to, to Grant. On the share purchase side, I think under the current 500 mil uh, authorization, you, you had a $200 million tranche uh, to begin with, uh, which should suggest that that tranche is almost used up. Is there any, you know, do, should you expect that to new tranche to be um, uh, to be opened or is it already I'm, I'm just a bit unsure now that you don't have the yeah. same disclosures around it as you were listed on Oslo yeah thanks for the good question and and yeah just to remind everyone that now we're delisted de from the Oslo stock exchange we no longer have certain disclosure requirements with respect to the buyback those sort of sub authorizations like the 200 million is no longer required. And so we will not be announcing sub authorizations. We've got the blanket authorization from our board of 500 million, which was provided by a board in the second quarter. Remember the 200 million you're referring to was a sub authorization within that. That was a Norwegian disclosure requirement. And, and you're, you're correct, we are now um, essentially, through that 200 million, we've spent 192 of that 200 by the end of the third quarter, um, and and we can continue to buy back shares under the blanket 500 million authorization, which is going to extend over a two-year period from uh, from Q2 this year to Q2 2026. Perfect. Thank you so much, all of you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Your next question comes from Hamed Korsand with BWS Financial. Your line is open. Good morning. Could you just talk about a little bit of the negotiation of the talk process that you have with potential customers? Is is there, Are they just holding off and just saying, wait, or is this more about their own supply chains and their timing because of the price of oil? Uh, it's uncertainty. So it's what's happening with commodity price, what's happening with their own supply chains. Um, it's also a reallocation of their portfolios. Uh, most of our clients have global portfolios, so some are saying they'd rather invest in one region versus another. <clears throat> and then it, it's also their return of capital to their own shareholders. So, so it's this big pot of uncertainty that's leading them to deferred decisions, and it is a deferral. We're seeing things get pushed into 26 from 2025. All right, and, and then the other question is, are you done with your uh, special surveys for uh, 25, or are they being pushed until there's actual contracts? Uh, I mean, we, we do have one scheduled survey that we've spoken to before, that's scheduled for 2025. 
Um, uh, we are currently doing a, um, an SPS on the West Neptune, um, uh, and that may drift into, into next year, depending on how things go in terms of some of the cost of that. Um, and, and then also, I mean, when, when you're contemplating out of service time, Hamid, I'd, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to think that, you know, there's a number of potential causes of that. SPSs and, and five year surveys are, are one potential ingredient, but another one is, um, contract preparation costs. And as we think about the, you know, the opportunities in front of us in our fleet, um, there may well be some, you know, time, uh, required to prepare for, you know, long term contracts in other markets and things like that. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Ahmed. Your next question comes from Josh Jane with Daniel Energy Partners. Your line is open. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, first question in Simon's prepared remarks we talked about the company fo uh, optimizing your operations in 2025. I was just wondering if you could expand more on that, if you have any goals that you've laid out and potentially um, how you're thinking of that about that into next year. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, obviously, we're facing some near-term headwinds and, um, you know, early 25, maybe through the middle of the year, potentially, um, is, you know, showing some um, difficulties in the recontracting effort. We've recently cold-stacked the West Phoenix um, and released the crews there. So I think um, one of the things that we're, you know, is really important to us is, you know, how we uh, manage rigs that don't have um, contracting opportunities in front of them. And, and what we're going to be doing is taking our medicine um, if we're not able to secure work. Um, the turbulence in that market, we believe that at this point that that's going to be short term, but we need to make difficult decisions as quickly as we can and adjust our cost base uh, and our capital programs uh, in order to reflect the, um, you know, the business environment. So increasingly what I was signaling in the prepared comments increasingly is that we're going to do that in real time. Um, this is a very tough business. Um, and what I've learned in my sort of almost 30 years is, is that it's really important to manage the cost base at all points in the cycle, um, not just when, when times are bad. So as an organisation, we're very focused on being agile, um, lean, and, uh, and right-sizing the organisation to make sure we have enough people and that we assemble our assets, um, our human resources, our software, if you like, uh, to be able to you know, respond to you know, the needs that are in front of us um, we don't have much appetite for excess capacity. Understood. Thanks. And uh, to, uh, for my follow-up, um, just given the the market's importance to Cedral and your number of assets there, and you know how you're likely to be a player going forward, um, I wanted to ask a follow-up on the Gulf of Mexico, and if you expect to see any change in the near to intermediate term in that market just as a result of the new administration? That's an interesting question. <laughs> um, perhaps let me start, uh, Josh, and then yeah. I'll, I'll pass to Samir. I mean, I think it's fair to say that we don't really care who's in the White House. Um, you know, we're driven by shareholder returns. Um, uh, what I will say is that we think the offshore barrel will win in the longer term. Low 48 production is really about the law of diminishing returns, whereas Offshore has the volumes, has the reservoir upside, has the blue sky, and our customers are telling us that that is where the new production is coming from. Um, and um, onshore is important, but it's pinching out. So it's in the deep blue seas where we'll be replacing production um, going forward. Um, Samir, but... It's, so it, it's not politics, it's fundamentals. The, the geology doesn't change with whoever's in the White House. Um, at the end of the day, those barrels will get drilled, and it, there's... But they're more economic and they're cheap. They're lower carbon and cheaper to produce than anywhere else. So we do expect them to, to continue to get produced over time. Thanks for taking the questions. I'll turn it back. Thanks, Josh. Again, if you have a question, it is star one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from Noel Parks with Tui Brothers Investment Research. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Uh, just sort of following along with your um, uh, your last comment, um, I was just thinking about uh, exploration, and um, as you mentioned, the, the barrels are going to get drilled, drilled sooner or later. And um, you, you know, do you? I guess would trying to be conservative at at this point in the cycle. Um, does that kind of represent any change in your sense of? Um, 
you know, exploration outcomes, uh, just uh, as uh, as you know, different footprints get get explored and so forth. And and there does seem to be this consensus that funds do need to flow to the offshore, um, if nothing else, to just help uh, make a dent in um, in a global based decline. So, um, is there any thoughts you have on that? Yeah, look, uh, you know, I think we sort of hinted at it before. Uh, you know, we believe it's in the offshores where we're going to be replacing, you know, productions. Um, you know, that, that's where we can achieve rates of, of delivery that can't be matched onshore. Um, uh, certainly, as we think about the customers who have exposure to both onshore and offshore basins, we've noticed a, uh, a shift in their investment activities. And, you know, there's certainly a lot more activity coming down the pipeline, we believe. Um, that's somewhat uh, muted by the fact that you know all of our customers have such a short-term outlook and expenditure on exploration, uh, generally speaking, is at the bottom of their capital allocation priority list. Um, uh, and you yeah, but you know, you, if I take our portfolio, our, our rigs as a, as a microcosm, we are starting to see some exploration. You know, two years ago, there's almost zero exploration. You're starting to see, you know, on a long well program, it's, you know, we'll tack one well out of, you know, 10 or 12 uh, into an exploration well. But again, it, it's happening, but it's still relatively small on the margins. Got it. Thanks. That's, that's helpful perspective. And I mean, is it, um, um, so I mean, if, if customers then be due to oil price or whatever are sort of deprioritizing steady operations by hanging on to a rig, uh, just based on their own capital discipline is, is that sort of part of the shift that's happening then? Yeah, absolutely. That there is that there's real startup costs and switching costs, right? Putting a rig down and then starting it up has meaningful costs. But what we're seeing sure. with our client base is they're pushing that cost out further and further and saying, you know, we're going to preserve cash in the near term for either returning it to shareholders or, or reallocating it to different parts of their portfolio. And it, when you ask them privately, they'll say, yes, we acknowledge that there will be an incremental cost to pick this rig up in 2026. But it's a 26 problem, not a 2024, 2025 problem. Okay, wow. So that is definitely more sort of short-term thinking than we're used to in the in the deep water for sure. So, thanks. Helpful. Excellent. Thank you so much. With no further questions, this will end our Q&A session as well as today's conference call. We thank you for joining. You may now disconnect your lines.